It's just a privilege, Teresa, to share together in this time with you all this afternoon, honoring Doug and his life and his faith and your marriage and your family. And I just want to start by reading Doug's obituary, wonderful and beautiful. And Sarah and Scott, you wrote it, right? It's awesome. Douglas, Richard Douglas, Doug Maley of Emporia was called home to his Heavenly Father on Saturday, January 2nd, 2021 at the Emporia Presbyterian Manor. He passed away at age 69 after a long battle with the lasting effects of a stroke and a heart condition. He is preceded in death by his parents, Pete and Nadine Maley. Doug was born on March 12, 1951 in Topeka, Kansas, the son of Alvin Edward Pete and Novita Nadine Ferguson Maley. A few years later, he gained a new brother and best friend, Lance Maley. Lance? He spent his childhood in Council Grove in Emporia, Kansas. He graduated from Emporia High School in 1969, or as Doug liked to chant, sweet as heaven, twice as fine, we're the class of 69. I would have liked to hear him do that chant. While in high school, he excelled in football and gymnastics and caused a lot of good-natured havoc around town. That's what you did in that generation. That's, we all did that. After high school, he enrolled in, a college, in college at Kansas State Teachers College, majoring in chemistry. He then enlisted in the United States Army and completed his term in the Army Reserves. During his military service, he was stationed in Missouri at Fort Leonard Wood. It was also during this time that he married the love of his life, Teresa G. Thorne, on May 26, 1973, at Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Emporia. Doug and Teresa were blessed with two children, Scott and Sarah, and even more importantly, seven amazing grandkids. Doug was employed at KPL Westar Energy. Like everything else in life, he always gave 110% and worked hard to advance his career. He began in 1973 by fueling the line trucks for KPL. Eventually, he worked his way up to Power Meter Man. He loved to drive his children around town and point out various homes and businesses that he connected to the power grid. After his untimely retirement in 2000, you could find Doug drinking coffee with friends, in church on Sundays, or his most preferred place, at the beach with a care of beer in his hand. Doug and Teresa made the most of their time together. They loved to travel with friends and family and visited nearly all of the islands in the Caribbean multiple times. Doug was a member of First Baptist Church in Emporia and enjoyed the community and fellowship it provided. Doug was blessed with an amazing support system, including the Spangles Coffee Group. Nearly every day they could be found in the lobby solving all the world's problems, or at least gossiping about them, one cup of coffee at a time. And I always thought it was so neat, kiddos, that that group came over to the garage. When they couldn't be at Spangles, they were willing to come to the garage. I thought that was wonderful. Doug was instrumental in launching the Emporia Energy Girls Softball Organization in 1993. He served as co-founder and coach for many years, Many times he was known to encourage his daughter Sarah to practice her pitching, which led to her earning a softball scholarship in college. When's the last time you pitched softball? Three years ago. One of Doug's favorite things to watch was sports at all levels, from high school to professional. Always a hometown kid, he was an enthusiastic fan of the Spartans and Hornets. He also loved the Royals, Chiefs, and supported the Jayhawks and Wildcats equally which led to some household strife. One of the highlights was watching the Chiefs win the Super Bowl in 2020 after 50 years. Before his stroke, he was likely to be found at the gym, lifting weights, or obliterating, obliterating opponents on the racquetball court. And I've heard the stories. Yeah, these guys thought they were good until they played Doug. Doug would, he might even be nice enough to let him score a point, maybe, maybe. Doug would regularly arise before the sun to be at the gym before work, pursuing his passion of physical fitness. 
His workout regimens would leave most people half his age in the dust. His devotion to fitness inspired his son Scott to take up running marathons. Even after his stroke and in spite of seemingly insurmountable physical limitations from his illness, he continued to defy the odds. He would ride the LCAT to the gym, pushing himself to a level that only Doug Maley could achieve. Doug was the protector of his family and would have sacrificed himself to keep them safe. In fact, he did so on several occasions. One notable example was a freak accident at the Poirier High School track in 1987. The family was playing while Doug ran on the track, and a remote control airplane with a six-foot wingspan lost control and headed straight towards Teresa. He heroically pushed her out of the way and was struck in the leg by the plane's propeller, nearly losing his leg. I would have liked to have seen the scar. The injury required multiple surgeries and rehabilitation, and he used to show off his sizable scar, telling people he was bitten by a shark, <laughs> since the truth was too strange to believe. Another example is while driving his family home on the turnpike in 1991, a car appeared heading in the wrong direction, and head-on collisions seemed to be imminent. However, due to Doug's quick response, they swerved, Doug managed to maintain control of the van despite being hit on the driver's side and spun into the ditch. Doug would tell you the most terrifying moment of his life was after the crash while he made sure everyone he loved was safe. His family was his life and he would have done anything for them. There are so many stories to share about Doug and his life that you could write a book about it. One thing is unequivocally true. If you meet Doug Maley, if you met Doug Maley, you are not likely to forget him. His legacy will live on in the hearts of all of those who knew and loved him. Surviving family members include wife Teresa of the home, son Dr. Scott and Kimberly Maley of Stillwell, Kansas, daughter Sarah and Nathan Olson of Langford, South Dakota, grandchildren Charlotte, last name? Retallick. Emily Olson, Kendrick Maley, Lillian Olson, Miles Retallick, Grant Maley, and Theodore Maley, which I got several fist pumps from them earlier. That's wonderful. Brother Lance and Jennifer Maley of Kerrville, Texas, and many nieces, nephews, cousins, family, and friends. That was very, very nice. Teresa's going to come share. Thank you for being here today to celebrate the life of a wonderful man, Doug Maley. Doug loved his family. He thought Sarah and Scott were the best of the best. He loved seeing them as such wonderful adults, parents, spouses, and hard workers. Scott as a medical doctor and Sarah as an academic advisor at Northern State University. And oh, how he loved his daughter-in-law, Kimberly, and his son-in-law, Nathan. But the one thing he loved the most was the seven grandkids. Emily first made Doug a papa. When she was born, we jumped in the car and drove to Kansas City in the middle of the night, it seemed like, and she was beautiful. Then came Kendrick. He was born 10 years ago this week. We drove to Omaha in the cold and snow just to hold and love on him. Then came Lillian, our little miracle precious girl. And oh, were we excited and we felt so lucky when we got to add Charlotte and Miles to our family. They were a wonderful addition to our fun-loving group. Then came Grant and Theodore to make our family complete. Such adorable little ones. 
The one thing Doug loved the most was traveling to the Caribbean islands. We have been to more islands than I can even list. It was always the same, though. We would load Doug up in the wheelchair. I'd put a bag on his lap. I'd be pulling a suitcase. I'd have a bag over my right arm and a bag over my left arm. And usually, there would be some nice young man who would come up to me and say, ma'am, can I help you? And Doug and I would say, no, we've, we're good. We got it. Doug was such a fighter. He was the strongest, healthiest guy I know. He was a runner, racquetball player, and softball coach. I fell in love with Doug when I was 16 and I've loved him ever since. He was my person. He was my rock. I adored him. And when he became disabled, nothing changed in how I loved him. I want each of you to know that you now have a guardian angel, and it's Doug. And if there is anything to be learned from Doug's life, it is don't wait. Do it now. Have fun. See the world. Love your family. Because even though Doug had the strokes and was disabled and his health was poor, we still had a lot of fun. And we went a lot of places. An example of this was two years ago, we took the whole family to Turks and Caicos in the Caribbean. Oh my goodness, it was fun. And yes, the flights were long, the kids were little. But we have such good memories of that now. Because it was a blast. And Doug was so happy to do that for his family. I know that Doug is up in heaven now, and he is driving his little red pickup truck. <laughs> I know he's trying to find a place to work out. Or maybe he's trying to find a beach. And at that beach, he'll be looking for a beer or a double rum and coke. Until we meet again, Doug, enjoy my love. From what I hear, there's a pretty cool street of gold that he gets to be running on. <laughs> One of the things that I'm always going to remember um, is his smile and his positive attitude, which was just always amazing to me. And yes, when I was at the gym not that long ago, he would come in and just outwork me by far. And, and what also was amazing to me, I don't know if you guys knew this about your dad, everybody knew him in that gym. I don't, it, it seemed like everybody knew Doug Maley. And you all know that it was about 20 years ago when Doug had his strokes. You know, it, it put Doug and Teresa on a little different path than they ever would have imagined. And somewhere in the process, it became very hard for Doug to be a believer. It, it just did. And then Doug and Teresa started coming to to church and God moved in Doug's heart and I'll never ever forget the Sunday that Doug came down the aisle right here and regave his heart to the Lord you know what day that was that was the best day ever you know Doug and I then had many conversations about why God 
does what God does and why God allows certain things and what we do in the meantime, what, what our lives are to be about. And, and one of the things I saw was Doug truly, honestly gave God his all. When he did that, it just, it, it, he really wanted to give God his all. He wanted to join the church. He wanted, what can I do? And, you know, he was already part of the family. So it was just kind of official. And what's been so neat for me about with that is when Doug said, Lord, my life is completely yours. When he did that, it was amazing. Teresa can, can testify to, to that change. And God blessed Doug with a sense of peace. That God drawn near to Doug and Doug drawn near to God. God just blessed Doug with not that sense of peace being away in the lostness, but a sense of purpose and a sense of peace. And it was, it was just neat. Doug would look for opportunities to encourage a young person here in the church family. I can't count the number of times that, that he would ask me about my daughter. How's Coley and her health and how she was doing? And it, another thing it did, it... it brought Doug a new sense of joy. It really did. It, one of my f other favorite memories, there are just so many. I just love you guys so much. It, it, I'll always cherish this. You know, often on Sunday mornings, I'll be right here, and God will give us something in the Scripture about forgiveness or grace or love, and I'll say, you know what? You know, that's something I need. And I want to invite you to Give that to God and, and let God take that. And if you want to make that commitment to be more forgiving or show more grace, you come up and pray with me to do that. And several times, God moved in Doug's heart, and Doug came up to that make that commitment, and Teresa said it scared her to death. <laughs> because I would say, you guys, come on up. You know, come on up and pray with me. And Doug would take off. <laughs> and she was worried that he was going to fall, but he didn't even think of that. He was just going. And what was so neat is, you know, they sat oh, two-thirds of the way back on this side. Somebody on this side might grab his arm and walk on up with him if they saw him coming by. And it, and it kind of reminded me of that knocking you out of the way with the airplane. You know... Um, Doug was only ever thinking of you first. And, and he did that with God. He just, when, when God said, hey, uh, when he said, hey, Lord, I want to give you my heart, he just put God first in, in every way he possibly could. And if he wasn't sure how, that's what we talked about. What about this? You know, I, I told um, Teresa this week, I can't, wait to visit with him in heaven either. I truly can't. It's, it's, it's going to be awesome. What, what a beautiful, wonderful, awesome hope we have. That's what God does for us. Would you pray with me? Lord, you know that I can't put into words how thankful I am that Doug and Teresa have been part of our family and part of my life their friendship, their love. Lord, we want to thank you for the hope that you give us, the hope that Doug has. Thank you for creating Doug and just giving him a truly unique personality. Thank you for his love for his wife, for his children, for his grandchildren, and for his friends and church family. And God, part of my prayer today is that everyone who is in this room, people who are close to Teresa and Doug and, 
and love them. My prayer, Lord, is, is that they will really see, really see the difference that you made in Doug's life. The joy, the peace, the happiness. And that, that every single one will open their hearts to you like Doug did. To, to your leading and, and guiding. Because Lord, when we give you our hearts, no matter what this life brings us, we can live with joy and peace. Bless this time together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Cheryl, would you come and sing? Thank you, Sarah. How is a daughter supposed to sum up her feelings about her dad in just a few minutes? <laughs> Even if I had days or weeks up here to talk about him, I don't think it would be possible to say everything that I want to say. Everyone here today or watching from afar knows the things about him that made him such a wonderful guy. Whether you knew him before his strokes or only after he'd had his strokes. It didn't matter. The strokes didn't change the qualities of Doug Maley that made him Doug Maley. He was funny and caring and hardworking, loyal and strong. Boy, was he strong. <laughs> my brother made a joke the other day how my dad once wore a pair of dress shorts 
in a photo for the church directory just so that he could show off his enormous quads. <laughs> Little did I know, mom just told me this today, that that was just a few weeks after his leg was nearly cut off by the remote control airplane. So we'll give him a little grace. <laughs> but if you knew Doug Maley in the first half of his life, you know that he had massively muscular legs. He was always working out and doing something physical to stay fit. By the time Scott and I came around, his days of the really heavy weightlifting were mostly behind him, but still, he could squat some seriously impressive weight, and his legs were so strong. But when I think of my dad, what I think about are his arms. To me, as a little girl, my daddy's arms were enormous, and I used to grab onto his bicep, and he would press me like I weighed nothing. <laughs> or he'd pick me up and tell me to stay tight, and he'd curl me like a weight bar. <laughs> and I'd giggle, and I'd think that it was the funniest thing ever. And later on, when I got older and I started conditioning for softball, we'd occasionally lift weights together, and he'd have me spot him on the bench press. And I remember thinking, if this weight falls, there's nothing I can do about this. <laughs> because he was always lifting 200 pounds or some crazy amount of weight. In the first half of my life, my dad was a big, strong guy. But he was also a huge teddy bear. He was patient and loving and always affectionate. I remember one time in the summer when I was little, I was wearing a tank top and shorts in the house, and I was cold. <laughs> Dad was always hot because he worked outside or exercised so frequently that my parents kept the air conditioner down really low in the summer. I remember complaining I was cold, and he said, Sarah, either put on a coat or go outside. <laughs> So I went outside, stood on the porch for a little bit until I warmed up. Then I went back inside. A little while later, I complained again because I was cold, and he told me to go back outside. Did it a few times. Finally, he said, come here. I'll warm you up. He held out his arms, and I crawled into his lap, and I snuggled into him, and he held me close until I got warm. And I just remember feeling so safe in his big, strong arms. <laughs> Those arms caught about a million softballs over the years. <laughs> Mom and dad and other parents in town were starting a traveling softball program for girls. And we needed a pitcher for the team. And I think dad decided it was going to be me. I don't think I decided. I think he did. <laughs> he must have recognized that I had some potential as a pitcher because he was the one who encouraged me to start pitching. He took me to my very first pitching clinic and was the one always wanting to practice to perfect my pitches. He was known for saying, come on, Sarah, let's go throw a ball around. And I'd grumble and grab my mitt, and he'd grab his mitt and a five-gallon bucket of balls, and we'd go throw. In my early years of softball, he spent more time running after my wild pitches than actually catching them. But once I got older, and I gained a little more control, he could just sit on that five-gallon bucket and hardly move his mitt at all. In all of my years of high school and traveling softball, Dad only missed one game the entire time. And that was because he was working. And this was back in the days before cell phones. So my mom <laughs> called him from the payphone in the parking lot throughout the game so that he'd know what was happening. He was disappointed that he couldn't be there at that game. It wasn't until I became an adult and had children of my own that I realized just how much effort it truly takes to be at your kids' activities. And, but he was always there, always there. I asked my girls, my daughters, on separate occasions, what they will remember about their papa. And I thought for sure they would say something about him dancing on a cruise ship or 
lounging in a deck chair, watching them go down a water slide on one of our multiple vacations to the Caribbean. I was actually kind of shocked when they both said the exact same thing. They both said that they will always remember arriving to Mimi and Papa's house after hours in the car. They'd be tired and road weary and ready to be out of the car. They'd walk in and they'd see Papa sitting in his chair with his arms outstretched, waiting to snuggle them close and welcome them to his home. He'd joke with them and hug them and was genuinely happy that they were there. I loved that answer <laughs> because it reminded me that that is what, exactly what happened to my dad on January 2nd when he went home to his heavenly father. I take great comfort in knowing that he was greeted with welcoming outstretched arms when he arrived in heaven. He fought for so long here on earth and we are blessed to have had him for an additional 20 years that we didn't think we were ever gonna get with him. But he was tired and he was weary and he was ready to be home. I think that my nine-year-old daughter Lillian said it best last Saturday on the day that dad passed away. She said, Mom, you know how some people say that the best day of your life is the day that you get married or the day that you have kids? Well, it's really the day that they go home to be with Jesus. And now our Papa is a guardian angel. It's so true. Though my dad is no longer with us here on earth, I'm comforted knowing he is fully restored in heaven. His muscular legs and arms are back in his new and improved heavenly body. Maybe he's drinking a cup of coffee with his buddies that went before him, or maybe he's sitting on a heavenly beach listening to Margaritaville. I don't know. I don't know how that all works. But what I do know is that someday when it's my time, my dad will be waiting there for me with outstretched arms, ready to hold me tight and welcome me home with big, strong arms, the ones that once kept me safe and warm. And I look forward to that day. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Scott? Well, Scott's coming up. South Dakota girls, Papa's going to be like this when you leave this earth. And he'll be waiting for you like this in heaven, just like he was waiting for you when you went to his house. It's going to be wonderful. Wow, that's a tough act to follow, Sarah. <laughs> I'm glad you included my uh, hilarious joke in there also. So. <laughs> Dad, so many things I could say to you right now. Your earthly life is over, but now you get to live on in heaven and in the hearts of your family and friends. Here on earth, your earthly body failed you but now you get to have your body and your strength back in heaven. You certainly deserve this after all of the trials and tribulations you went through. Doug Maley was a man of few words, but he possessed immeasurable strength and determination. And for what he said with those few words, he meant a lot and he said a lot. Dad, for all that you went through over the last 20 years of your life, I firmly believe that a lesser person would not have survived in the way that you did. You were 49 years old when you got sick, and in fact, your 50th birthday was spent in a tiny little break room at a hospital where the nurses there graciously allowed us to have a small cake and a gathering of family, which now in the age of COVID is completely unheard of. That would never happen. I remember my Aunt Carolyn trying to move the cake towards his uh, you know, face there so we could blow out the candles. Meanwhile, he's got oxygen on, and Sarah had to uh, say, whoa, 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 let's, uh, let's uh, put an end to this before something bad happens. <laughs> but uh, that's how you spent your 50th birthday, Dad. Um, 
What really bothers me is that so many people have only known you after the time of your illness. Your ability to walk, talk, balance, swallow, so many other things were all compromised from your illness. However, your loving, joking, sarcastic personality did not change. It was still there, but underneath layers and layers of neurologic deficits. Sorry, I'm a doctor. I had to throw in some medical words from time to time. That's, that's what we do to feel good about ourselves. So, um, You were still there underneath all the neurologic deficits, but it was difficult for you to be the person that you, you were and that you knew you were. I can only imagine how frustrating that would be to know that something happens and you have the perfect comeback or joke or response, but you just can't get it out. And 20 years of that, that's gotta be so frustrating. You were always quick with the joke and had an animated personality. Your stroke made that impossible. Life truly isn't fair. And the last 20 years of your life are an embodiment to that statement. You spent 20 years in immeasurable pain and suffering that you just did not deserve. I always remember, if you remember back in the 80s and 90s, before we all had iPhone 12s and Androids and stuff, the home camcorders, which easily weighed 50 pounds and took up an entire shoulder there, and probably weighed as much as the, the dumbbells that you lifted, which that's, you know, strong guy like you, Dad, that you were perfect for that. But Dad would always have that around and available and took some great, great family videos of us that are live on forever on some old VHS tapes. And when you got this, Dad, you were like any person who's super proud of their new toy. So our family video videos really contain some true gems that we can all look back on. So classic examples are, we'll, we'll start with me here, uh, rocking out with a little blue foam guitar to Moni Moni. And not the Billy Idol version, the original Tommy James and the Shondells version, because uh, that's the real one. And then uh, one of Sarah's many numerous choreographed stage productions that she forced her brother and any whatever available cousins were there at the time to, to do in. So, and, and I, I mean, she, she forced us to pretty much. <laughs> or classically, when my mom, on either New Year's or the day after New Year's, poured the leftover soup down the sink and clogged the drain so much that we had to get a plumber out to fix it, I believe. <laughs> or uh, when uh, I, as a four-year-old, five-year-old, I don't know, told Daddy to leave my mommy alone. <laughs> So those are some, some good ones, but what strikes me in those videos is that this is the way I'll forever remember my dad. My healthy dad. My dad who hadn't had a stroke yet. Sure, he had a ticking time bomb of a genetically bad heart valve, but that's the dad I remember. In those videos, you're the person I remember, and it's the person that you wanted to be despite a body that failed you. So today on your funeral, I just want you to know how much I love you and how proud I am of you. Like I said, a lesser person would never have survived the additional 20 years that you did. Your strength and mind, spirit, and body, it allowed you to meet your grandchildren, which you never would have if you hadn't survived this, all seven of them. And your grandkids will have amazing memories of you and photos of you and videos of you. And hopefully that inspires them as they grow up. I've always been proud to be your son, but seeing the lasting impression you've left on this earth, left on this earth lets me know that you were truly a blessing. I love you, Dad, and I'm forever, forever thankful for you. And until we meet again, Um, you know, I, just a couple thoughts. 
as we close. You know, falling in love with that dude at 16 and three years later being married and thinking you're so mature at 19 and 22 and then 47 years of marriage and 50 years of being together. Number one that sticks out for me, it was always and first you and the kids and the family. And I, you guys, I can't count the number of stories I heard about little Scott and Sarah and the grandkids. And oh, you grandkiddos, he, Papa loved you. He loved you. He loved it when you would come to church with him. That was one of his favorite things ever. You know, Scott, you said that you wish people could have met him before. Let me tell you something. I want to share something with you guys that um, your mom and dad have done for me. Excuse me. I might have to have you come up and read it, Scott. <laughs> They've been role models for me in my life when things aren't easy. Our tendency might be to say, you know, mope, say it's not fair. One, say, one thing your mom would say in the midst of this testing at times and patience, she would say, this has to be 10 times worse for Doug. 10 times harder for Doug than me. And you think of all your family trips, um, whether it was the staff at the airport or the little girl or guy bringing your dad his drink at, at the chair. Why were they so eager to come up and say, let's help you, can we help you? Why? Because he had a smile on his face. He was a joy to be around. He was positive. You know, I've looked at those picture books at your house. I love, love seeing those. It's a wonderful, they have picture books, a, a stack of them, of the trips that they would take. And, and it, it, they're joy. You know, think about it. It's, your, your dad had the right heart attitude. A heart that God filled with joy and peace and love. And most, mostly for Doug, he received that sense of peace that he needed. And, and those trips were awesome, even if you drank the bad water in the Dominican Republic. For a lot of you, it wasn't good. But what did you do on your last trip? What were you talking about? Where are you going on your next one? Did your mom and dad have reason to complain? Yes. Did they at times? Probably. But that teenage love never left. And they lived that vow that you make at your wedding that goes, what God had joined together, let no one or anything put us under. Let no one tear apart. I'm very thankful to be a part of your lives, Teresa. Cheryl, would you come sing? <clears throat> Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now am found was blind but now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace up 
hear the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come, tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, I, I pray that Teresa and Sarah and Scott and their spouses and the grandkids and the whole family, Lord, that they will just feel your arms around them today and in the weeks and months to come. And I thank you, Lord, that every time we will think of Doug, we will smile. Because that's, Lord, what I'm going to remember. And I hope the grandkiddos really remember that too. Papa smiling. And, and just his smile and joy. And Lord, I'll probably also think of Doug every time I see a croissant also. Um, Loving his croissants and cookies. And Lord, we can smile because he's safe in your arms. And he's healthy and smiling and whole and able to run on those streets of gold. And Lord, we can just smile because of who you made him to be. And Lord, thank you for also being a loving and gracious and giving Father who will love us forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.